Today we remember the life and service of William David Burns Jr. who was born on October 24, 1920 in a farmhouse a few hundred yards south of the current Chatham United Methodist Church in Chatham County, North Carolina. As one of Billy's 11 nephews and nieces, I find this program difficult for many reasons, but the first part was pretty straightforward. What would Billy have wanted you to hear? Billy's life ended in a submarine and a memorial service about his life and death. It seems clear that Billy would have wanted you to know something about the men who served with him and what they did together in risking their lives and eventually dying together. And we have some of Billy's letters, so it's equally certain Billy would have wanted you to know more about his family and the Chatham Church community where he built so many friendships. So let's begin with the lady in his life, the submarine named the USS Scamp. For the history of the USS Scamp, I've relied primarily on a webpage called On Eternal Patrol. That webpage begins to describe its purpose like this. Since the acceptance of the first submarine in the U.S. Navy in 1900, over 4,000 men have lost their lives in the silent service. The great majority of them died in the period between December 7, 1941 and September 1945. That's the years of World War II. In addition to detailed information about submariners from that webpage, the Navy has also declassified the actual logs written by the officers and crew of the scamp. You will hear an excerpt from those logs. The scamp was manufactured in Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, Kittery, Maine, between March 6 and July 20, 1942. Approximately eight months after Pearl Harbor, it took only 106 days to put her in the water. The scamp met her crew in New London, Connecticut in September for about three months of training. The scamp left Connecticut on January 19, 1943 went through the Panama Canal and arrived in Hawaii on February 14, 1943. Over the next 14 months, the scamp and his crew conducted seven war patrols in the South Pacific, with stops in Brisbane, Australia, Midway Island, Pearl Harbor, and New Guinea. One summary says that in these seven patrols, the scamp and his crew sank six enemy ships, damaged another eight, totaling over 88,000 tons. That 7th patrol, however, had serious problems. I'm quoting mainly from the logs. On April 7, 1944, 35 days into its 7th patrol, the scamp encountered six cruisers escorted by destroyers and planes. She dived and the destroyers passed overhead, her presence a scant 100 feet below the surface. She returned to the surface at 2.05 p.m. but was forced down by a plane. A little later, she tried to surface again, but was attacked by a diving float plane. As she crashed dive to escape the enemy plane, an aerial bomb exploded. All hands were knocked off their feet by the explosion, and all power was lost. There's more accounts and more to those accounts, but the bottom line is that all agree that the crew of the scamp was in critical mode for about seven hours when she finally regained power and was able to head toward base. That took nine more days with a crippled sub. The logs don't say it, but some of the crew must have thought that they would not survive this attack. The scamp and her crew did survive, but there were certainly 10 days when that was uncertain. In the next mission, the eighth one, Billy and 82 other members of the crew would not survive. By my count, this photo shows 63 of the 83 sailors listed on Eternal Patrol webpage. All 83 were on that final mission and never returned. Billy would want us to remember all of them. We do want to remember all of them and their wives, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and friends who were left behind. Those family and friends miss them the rest of their lives, and we are all among the countless relatives and other members of their communities whose life is richer because of their surface and sacrifice. And we often wonder about how the scamp's crew and their children would have enriched our community even more had they survived. But before I get to the scamp's final mission, I want to turn to Billy's background, his family, and their final visit. Thanks to the efforts of Billy's youngest sister, my Aunt Natalie Miller, there's a collection of family correspondence during the war years 
and some other documents. Billy attended Chatham Methodist Church his whole life. He's a graduate of Pittsburgh High School. He enlisted in November 1941 before the attack on Pearl Harbor and the decision of the United States to declare war. From his earliest letters, my favorite is an excerpt from December 2, 1941, five days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Billy wrote, I started trade school the day we got back, so I won't have to work in the kitchen. The school just happened to start on December 1, and they needed some entry men, so I took it up. The extra money I brought along is going to come in handy buying books and supplies. Today, I laugh when I heard Uncle Billy became a machinist so he wouldn't have to work in the kitchen. You see, Billy was of the same generation of my father and two of my uncles who were also challenged by boiling water. I was astonished that he had to spend his own money for books and supplies for trade school and Billy's final rank was Motor Machinist Mate, Second Class U.S. Navy. Two and a year, half years after he enlisted in May of 1944, Billy was a seasoned submariner with seven patrols in enemy waters and a near-death experience under his belt. One month after the crew and the scamp survived that attack, Billy was given leave and came home. His mom and dad, my grandparents, greet him in this picture, together with his two brothers and two sisters and one of his two nephews who were born before Billy died. This picture was taken on the home place where he and his siblings were raised. Years later, his nephew Barry Burns and Phyllis would raise their three children in the same location and plant vegetable gardens and fruit trees where you see them standing. So let me introduce you to Billy's immediate family in that picture. His youngest sister, Madalie, is 16 years old, a future nurse who died at 92 years old. She named her youngest son, William David Miller, 16 years later after her father and Billy. Their father is hiding behind Madalie, an appropriate location in any picture for all of us fathers. The father, William David Burns Sr., is 60 years old and will die in 1955. Billy is peeking over the shoulder of his oldest sister, Mary Elizabeth. She is holding the oldest grandchild, Robert Burns, age three. Robert is Lemuel's oldest child. Not pictured is Lemuel's second child, Barry, who would soon turn two years old. So Billy met the next generation in his shortened life. Mary Elizabeth, age 27 in this picture, died at 63 years old. She named her youngest son, William David Danley, seven years later. The next two generations have three more Williams. They would be with Billy's grandnephew and double grandnephews, a total of five more in the succeeding generations. Also in the homecoming picture are Billy's mom, his older brother Lemuel, and his youngest brother Edwin. Billy's mother turned 56 while Billy was home and lived another 34 years. Lemuel was 30 years old and lived until 2001. Edwin was 21 in this picture and lived until 2009. I wanted to pause here with a reflection. Some of our memories are documented, some not. For Billy, I could not find any letters to his mother mentioning the ladies in his life. In his letters to his younger brother Edwin, it was another story. On one occasion in 1944, Billy wrote, I'm going to go bowling in a few minutes. Boy, you should see the little girl I'm going boy bowling with. Boy, is she a knockout. And his other brother Lemuel shared other stories about their childhood. One involved working for a neighbor in his fields on a particularly wet day. Lemuel explained that he and Billy worked all day in muddy fields barefoot. Growing up on a farm in the 1920s and 1930s meant they only had one pair of shoes, so they would never take the chance of damaging that precious footwear. The shoes came off before entering the muddy fields. We are fortunate that the family has kept photos and letters, some of which are more than 80 years old. I'm thankful that Billy's sister, Maddie, organized many of those in an album that has helped the next generation understand her brother Billy and his service. 
Mail like this was important for the soldier, sailor, and their families. While there were sensors to prevent inadvertent disclosure of strategically significant information, the mail was a morale booster for both those who wrote the letters and those who received them. And that mail provides some memories we treasure. For example, Billy sent much of his pay home. In one instance, Billy wanted to pay the preacher. In another, Billy hoped the funds would be available to support his sister Maddie's college expenses. And some mail prompts a history lesson. We're looking at an image of a V-mail letter from Billy to his sister Mary Elizabeth. V-mail was short for victory mail. That was a particular postal system put into place during the war to drastically reduce the space needed to transport mail, thus freeing up room for other valuable supplies. A special form was used to permit the letter to be photographed to microfilm. The small film was then transported and reproduced and delivered to the recipient. When the V-mail was reproduced, the recipient would have a small letter, maybe three inches by four inches. And this photo is an example of the V-mail letter that the author would send to be photographed. It's about eight and a half by 11 inches close to our standard paper size today. This V-mail was written by Billy's mother and reads, December 20, 1944. Dear Billy, it has been some time since we have heard from you, but we hope that you are well and safe. The last letter we had from you is dated October 10. It's just five more days till Christmas. Madalie is coming home this p.m. and Edwin is to come home Friday and will stay till the next Tuesday. Natalie said she was counting the weeks, days, and hours. We wish that you will be here too. The draft ends with the word and. Before Billy's mother was writing that V card, the scamp had returned for its eighth patrol. On October 16, 1944, the scamp left Pearl Harbor. Billy had written his last day letter a day, few days before that October 16 departure. One record says that the scamp's mission at that time was to provide rescue services for downed aviators during an assault on Tokyo. A message was received from the scamp on November 9, which indicated that she was in the patrol area, that is, enemy waters. No further communications were received. When the scamp did not reach other checkpoints, including a December 5 date at Midway Island, She was reported presumed lost on war patrol in enemy waters, effective December 21. After the decision was made to declare the scamp and its crew MIA, this telegram was sent to the Moncure Post Office. The mailman, Jack Johnson, delivered the telegram to Billy's mother. Jack Johnson's car was in the driveway as Madalie arrived home from her first semester at college. Billy's father arrived a few minutes later. The telegram reads in part, December 20, 1944. The Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you that your son is missing following action while in service to his country. So Billy's mother never finished that V-card that she also began writing on December 20, 1944. She did save that letter. I believe she saved that letter for us today. For years, Billy's mother sat on the front porch and looked down a dirt road that led to Chatham Church. She was often hoping and praying that Billy would come round that curve. Though she almost never discussed her grief with those who survived, Billy's mother did correspond with others in her situation. There were many mothers who lost their children in World War II and grieved together. On December 27, 1945, a year later, letters were sent to the next of kin for the scamp crew that there was no information to suggest that any of the crew had survived, and the Navy was reluctantly forced to the conclusion that each of them was dead. According to most sources, over 400,000 members of the U.S. military died in World War II. While this is the Purple Heart awarded to Billy, 
We remember not only the service of Billy and the sacrifice of Billy, his family and friends and this community of Chatham Church. We remember those 400,000 who would have received a Purple Heart and thank God for their service. And we remember the millions in the United States and many millions more around the world who suffered then and continue to suffer today because our lives would have been richer had they all survived. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, protect your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ.